Hello everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on your time zone. Before I start, I would like to thank Katarzyna for the opportunity to participate in our mythical nature. The title of my presentation today is A Posthumanist Perspective, Plants, Animals and Things in Children's Books about the Classical Past. My presentation consists of three sections. First, I shall set the scene, introducing posthumanism and the books of Papadopoulos publications. Second, I shall discuss a selection of illustrations from a posthumanist perspective. And finally, I shall draw some concluding remarks to highlight that the classical past is suited for a critical posthumanist reappraisal. Section 1. Posthumanism. Posthumanism is a contested term that criticizes, perhaps at too high a level, the project of humanism, as we have come to know humanism since the Renaissance with the rediscovery of Greek and Roman antiquity, substantiating notions of the hegemony of humans. The story of classical antiquity and the story of our mythical nature can be told differently if this story is sanitized from Western legacies, be it in the Renaissance or in later centuries. Posthumanism takes us beyond anthropocentrism and offers a more than human view of the world. But what is posthumanism? Posthumanism, posthumanism is not a coherent theoretical body. As a perspective, it is a complex set of ideas that challenges the supremacy of humans over the natural and over the material world. Rosie Braidotti is a philosopher who urges us to think critically and ethically about relations of domination that favor the hegemony of the white, the able-bodied man in Western societies. Bright Doty criticizes the key characteristics of ideal leaders, whiteness, masculinity, normality, youth and health. To some degree, posthumanism overlaps with feminism, postcolonial thinking, material culture and object-oriented theories. Posthumanism is a child of our modern era and it resonates well with ecological movements. Through critical posthumanism, it is hoped that future generations can find a way to cope with the climate crisis. Now, posthumanism may sound heavy going for little children. I would like to propose, however, that Alternative ways of conceptualizing the world as a world of mutually responsible relations between plants, animals, things and people should start early, even at pre-primary school. This alternative way of thinking can be different from teaching sustainable development, which is inherently about human action that balances economic, social and environmental growth. In discussing young children's books about classical antiquity, I'm interested in how children could even question the very essence of big figures. For example, should uh, children admire or criticize the Greek gods? We have Artemis up here. Heroes like Heracles. Heracles is down here. And military figures like Leonidas, we have Leonidas here, based on how such figures related to the natural and the material worlds. I would like to explore how posthumanism allows for a creative rewriting of myth, of history and prehistory. This reconsideration of classical antiquity is possible 
even when the illustrations that I'm going to be discussing today show gods, heroes and mortals with human bodies, and even when the anthropomorphic actors engage with a funny mixture of ancient and modern material culture, lyras, flower pots, helmets and watering cans. I shall leave out of my talk monstrous bodies and hybrid bodies that take us beyond the human condition, although non-human bodies have been discussed in connection with posthumanist perspectives and classical texts. As an intellectual movement, posthumanism has affected the humanities, the social sciences, literary output and classics, with an edited volume appearing in 2020 called Classical Literature and Posthumanism. The books I shall be analysing today, however, are peculiar. They are peculiar for two main reasons. First, they are Greek books. The author, Philippos Mandilaras, the illustrator Natalia Capazzulia, and the publisher Papadopoulos Publication. Publications. They are all based in Greece. Second, the books are educational material for very young children aged four and five. Let me discuss the two characteristics of the books in more detail. They are children's books produced in Greece, primarily targeting a Greek-speaking audience. In general, children's books in Greece have not been translated in other languages, have not had a global impact. And when we discuss posthumanism, we have to think big and global society, not least because the climate crisis is a global crisis and all about living in an interdependent world. As I see it, however, this particular books about classical myth, about antiquities, about ancient history, stand out. They are part of two successful and popular series, series called My First Mythology and My First History, and they are selling extremely well. They have been translated into multiple languages, English, German, Russian, to name a few, and they circulate widely. To give an example, the books were available to buy at the airport Eleftherios Venizelos when I was there in September 2020. The publisher is Papadopoulos Publications, which is a well-established family business in Athens specializing in children's literature. With these books about the classical past, I somehow believe that this publishing house is beginning to reach out to an international audience. To cite Roderick Beaton, Professor of Modern Greek Studies, in a connected global world, the academic study of modern Greece cannot and should not be a regional or local niche interest, end quote, Beaton writing in 2016. And to give a more recent citation by Richard Clogg, historian of modern Greece. Although Greece confronted the 2020 coronavirus pandemic more effectively than many of its European partners, the country's economy received a serious setback, the consequences of which were likely to affect the tourist industry end quote. Clearly, Greece is affected by global challenges. The appeal of these books within Greece and beyond may have a lot to do with Natalia Capazzulia's beautiful illustrations. Images are a powerful means to convey messages. Capazzulia's illustrations take cues from comics and give a fun version of what happened in ancient times. With such images, modern Greece displays and exports a watered-down version of a mythical historic and prehistoric heritage. However, as a genre, such books have not been analyzed in studies of modern Greece, let alone in reception studies about the classical past. 
The second reason why the books can be challenging to analyze is the very young age of the children. At the age of four and five, children attend pre-primary school, Nipia or Hio in Greece. Pre-primary school has become compulsory for children aged four and above since 2018-2019. But there is no coherent policy to teach mythology and ancient culture more generally at that level. Researchers in education usually discuss materials for the nursery with reference to children's developmental needs, such as the coordination of visual and motor habits, and also with reference to contemporary issues such as healthy food options and ecological awareness. To my knowledge, the illustrations uh, of books for four and five-year-olds have not been analyzed by sociologists, anthropologists, historians, and art historians uh, in connection with current affairs, Greek and international. I think that a posthumanist perspective offers an opportunity here because it encourages critical thinking about relations between human and non-human actors and discussion about the nature of these relations. Are they relations of domination and exploitation or of mutual respect and happy coexistence? The illustrator Natalia Capazzulia has placed actors in beautiful and varied landscape settings with lots of plants, trees, flowers and green meadows as you can see here. She has included small animals, birds, cats, dogs, turtles and fish, and big animals such as deer, bulls and lions. All these creatures either watch or participate in the story. Capaciulia's visual language of classical antiquity with a focus on multiple plants and animals reminds us of wider sources of mythical wisdom from the Near East. The illustrations could potentially appeal to immigrant children from Syria and other countries in the Middle East who have settled in Greece recently. The actors in the illustrations send messages about existing in, using and transforming the natural environment. We see the minoans of prehistoric Crete who bring plants uh, in pots to the island. We see the goddess Artemis who hunts in the forest and the demigod Heracles who wears a lion's skin. but the lion is alive with eyes wide open. We see Leonidas, king of Sparta, who stands on top of a hill in full armor as if he is a paradigm of an elite white male dominating the world as we have known since the Enlightenment in our Western modernity. Also, we see inventive baby Hermes using a tortoise shell to make a lyra to change nature into culture. And then we read that Hermes gets tired with music, feels hungry, and is after some 50 cattle who graze peacefully, unaware of Hermes' intentions to lead the cattle away, tweet one and sacrifice another. So, what kind of mythical nature is this? Question mark. Did people in the past care about plants and animals? Question mark. Did nature suffer from powerful characters, from statesmen, from kings and heroes and gods and goddesses? Question mark. Readers, especially adult lead readers, may ask such questions and compare with contemporary agendas about social justice, animal rights, and protecting the environment. The climate crisis in particular, with rising temperatures worldwide and extreme weather conditions, floods and wildfires that cause devastation, makes it appear that nature fights back and takes its revenge on human intervention and arrogance. 
there is badness in modern humanity that in one way or another we can associate with milestones in western history such as the industrial revolution the mechanization and wars driven by the exploitation of fossil fuels and the unmanageable inequalities between rich and poor did the seeds of this modern badness exist back in the classical past then the engagement with greek myth and history is a study of modern issues as i shall point out in the concluding remarks i move now to section two of the presentation to a more detailed discussion of images i start I start with prehistoric material, the Minoan civilization. So with reference to the image here um, on the left, there is an information box about the Minoan civilization with dates 300 to 1420 BC. We read that people came to Crete from Asia Minor looking for fertile land. The new settlers bring with them bronze weapons and tools as well as new ideas for commerce and seafaring. Yet, the illustration shows nothing of this material and technical revolution. Instead, Capachulia shows people disembarking and holding small plants in flower pots. Readers may find it amusing that newcomers took their plants with them, as we do today when moving houses. At this point, we can mention an influential education article from 2011 called Artifactual Critical Literacy, about how daily life interactions with objects really matter and they can be discussed in a classroom setting. So we can forget about the minors and we can refer to appropriate behaviours in the present. We need to care for our plants and not leave them uh, behind to die. So we can focus on the flower pots and forget everything else. And then we can return to the past. For a reader who knows about the Minoan palaces, the flower pots could symbolize the agricultural, agricultural basis of the successful palace economy. It would be accurate to postulate that the Minoans relied on agricultural produce. As recently argued in archaeological scholarship in a book from 2021, from the outset, settled life on Crete meant the cultivation of olive trees and grapevines, and in this way the Minoans developed a cultural dependency on oil and wine. We can push the argument further. Something that started low-key with small flower pots made a real difference to the island and was instrumental for the Minoan civilization. On the next page, you can see the image here on the right, we read about big cities and palaces, the Minoans mastering the seas and wealth and new ideas flowing into the island. As on the previous page, the image here does not quite follow the text. We see three young boys playing with a massive bull, with one boy performing acrobatics on the bull's back. The image, as also confirmed by the light blue background, recalls a famous Minoan fresco that shows the athletic and ceremonial event of bull leaping. If we bring together the text and the image on this page, the message for readers could be that the Minoans had time for leisure now that their economy was doing well and they were rich and well connected through sea trade networks. And here it may get a little nasty. The Minoans spent their spare time by putting an animal under stress to perform their acrobatics for whatever reasons, ritual, rites of passage and entertainment. In one way or another, the Minoans became masters 
of the animal kingdom, subordinating bulls, taking the animals out of their natural habitats and bringing them into a built environment as the architectural setting of the illustration implies. The bull has a will of his own and he is the protagonist of the event, but the bull complies and does as the young boys want. Humans drive the actions. We do have anthropocentrism here, and for that reason we can start our critique. Of course, the scene has been made appropriate for young children and the image not remind of modern bullfights, let's say in Spain, where the bull finally dies. There is no cruelty in the image. Questions about animal welfare may arise nonetheless. From a post-humanist perspective, moreover, children and adults may discuss critically whether this is a portrayal of human domination and of lust for power. Our mythical nature emerges as both unfamiliar and familiar. We do not have bull leaping in our modern era, especially not for children. The minor past is unfamiliar. We do continue, however, to have this lust for power and control in modern times, and this may start at a young age there could be moral warnings. Children like the young boys in the image should refrain from controlling behaviors, not only towards animals, but also towards peers and seniors, so that they learn to relate to others with respect and responsibility, and they become good team players and considerate leaders in the future. To summarize, Maino and Crete gave us an opportunity to criticize both the past and the present, and talk about relations between humans, plants and animals. I move now to historic material. According to Braidotti, a man should not be on top of the world, but here we do see Leonidas under the Greek sand dominating with his posture and armour, a rather dry landscape that appears to be passive. The vegetation has receded to make space for Leonidas. The author informs us that Leonidas was born to be a king, but also that he cared for his people. We come to like him then, because he is a caring leader, and the rest of the book confirms that. Looking at the illustration, however, we may wonder whether Leonidas' armour is a metaphor for the material world. It takes skill, labour and art to make and use a spear, a shield, breastplate and helmet. His body is culturally, technically and artistically mediated. Is Leonidas a human body? Question mark. The armor. The armor is ceremonial, signifying any elite male soldier in Greek antiquity and in the European Iron Age more generally. Yet the armor is also functional. It can protect Leonidas' body and it can inflict injury to others. Leonidas dominates because of his armor. His armor is not only about identity and about the cultural habits of uh, male elites. His armor makes him powerful and potentially a killer, not to be admired then, especially not by young children. The top of the hill could mean that Leonidas is at the top of the social hierarchy, which is precisely what posthumanism wants us to fight against, because there is a strong social justice agenda in posthumanism. So, our mythical nature emerges as a mirage of modern times. We could argue that Leonidas in the image is an ancient version of a white, of a white man in the Western capitalist system, who has succeeded because he mastered science and technology. Is this how people should behave if they go far in life? Should they feel that they are better than others? I turn to another illustration now where there's an explicit reference to the natural landscape. 
We read that Heracles, on his way back from his fifth labor, tries to forget about the manure in the stables. The pegs on Heracles and the lion's noses are quite funny. We see a dog and a rabbit covering their noses, presumably because Heracles stinks. But where is this place? Our author gives details of two rivers and we understand that we are at Olympia. This is a beautiful old green river valley and Heracles rejoices. The message is that the beauty of the landscape made our hero very happy. We may deduce that our hero is sentimental, needs relaxation and finds comfort in nature. Of course, the page here on the left could be used for environmental education, potentially outdoors. There could be general and specific messages. A general message could be that spending time outdoors is good for body and soul. A specific me message could be that this is Olympia before the games. And we can see that uh, the illustration here on the left comes from a book about the Olympic Games. And this is the front cover of the book um, on the right of the slide. So Heracles rejoiced within an unspoiled landscape before the building of facilities for the Olympic Games. So this is nature before culture. The beauty of the natural landscape, readers may think, invited human intervention, construction work, and the institutionalization of the games with their legacy and reinvention, affecting our modern era just as well. How should people today react and protect beautiful landscapes? Question mark. The question is quite relevant, not least because of devastating wildfires at Olympia in 2007, and again in 2021 in August as we speak. Let us now move to yet another image, but this image has clear social justice connotations. Here we have Exegestidis, Solon's father. The text informs us that although he came from a noble family, he was not rich and he did not own much land. The image here follows the text and it shows a man in a long white tunic watering some vegetables, possibly lettuce. There could be a moral message, we do not need much to be happy in life. And there could be a more practical message for readers to take up gardening. The modern looking watering can also reminds us of modern times. The setting is domestic. Nature has been transformed as indicated by the nicely ordered plants and the wooden fence. This kind, this kind of human intervention is acceptable. And Solon's father looks happy. We could say that the plants make our gardener happy. He takes care of them and they take care of his emotional well-being. This could be a relation of happy coexistence between man and nature. Somehow we forget that the vegetables will be consumed as salad. This means um, that uh, it's fine, uh, green vegetables are good for a healthy diet. The consumption of vegetables, however, is about human control. In our modern context, we are more sensitive towards animal welfare rather than the rights of plants. The following two images about Artemis and baby Hermes will highlight this point. The text here describes how Artemis grew up in the hordes, hunting wild animals in the company of deer and hunting dogs. The illustration shows Artemis walking happily in the forest, carrying birds over her shoulder and leading a deer. All the animals here are alive, as implied by their wide open eyes. Artemis, the huntress, seems to enjoy herself. And it must rain a lot for the landscape to be that green. So perhaps we are in mainland or in northern Greece, if we are indeed in Greece. But in any case, nothing recalls the arid and rocky landscapes of most Greek islands. 
forests have been important in children's literature in Greece ever since the seminal book by Zacharias Papantonio of the early 20th century called The High Mountains, Tapsila Vuna, and you can see an image here on the right. The book tells the story of children living in the forest, interacting with animals such as foxes and chicken that are popular in Greek folklore. The High Mountains was groundbreaking for its time for its focus on environmental education rather than ethnic identity building. I would like to suggest that what we see here in the illustration on the left of the slide is not very Greek either. Of course, our Artemis uh, sandals, white tunic, bow and small bag for holding arrows do remind us of the ancient Greeks, but her blonde hair stands out. She looks like a, a Northern European who likes hiking. Of course, the big question is whether this individual, whoever this person is in the forest, wherever this forest is, does something ethical by hunting birds. Also, what will happen to the deer? Is the deer like a domesticated dog, a docile companion, or will the deer be killed for its meat? And where are the animals taken to? Are they going to be removed from their natural habitat, as it happened to a bull in my own Crete who entered a courtyard to entertain an audience? We do have relations of human control and domination over the animal kingdom. And what could be really irritating is that the individual in the picture here is too carefree and smiley. The figure does not seem to be considerate, critically asking herself whether she has the right to carry away the animals and potentially kill them. Being a goddess, she does not need animal protein for subsistence and survival. Why does she hunt them? For fun? What kind of god do we have in Greek myth? With such images, children can criticize mythological actors. A creative exercise, perhaps involving digital humanities, could be to redraw Artemis walking in the forest, therefore accepting her wandering nature. But removing her hunting gear and the birds. In the end, we will have not Artemis, the huntress anymore, but a, a reimagined responsible female persona who liked walking outdoors, caring for plants and animals. Let me now move to my last image, which is perhaps the most thought provoking of them all. Using a turtle, Baby Hermes has made a musical instrument. We see that the turtle is still alive, emerging from beneath the shell. We read that Hermes got tired with playing the lyre, the lyra, excuse me, and he wanders off in search for food. How irresponsible. And then we read that he reaches a place in northern Greece where cattle graze peacefully and he wants to steal the cattle. The image here on the right shows baby Hermes saying mum in Greek, which is standard baby talk for I am hungry. Hermes is greedy. First, he used a turtle to make an instrument and now he wants to satisfy his appetite with a high protein meal. Hermes encapsulates the humanist perspective in which humans, especially when they are super intelligent, are elevated above other animate life forms. We see a cute baby in the illustration, but Hermes' actions are to be criticized. And in the pages that follow, we read that Hermes will lead 50 cattle to southern Greece and slaughter two of them. He does not need all 50 cattle. Hermes is not likable. He is quite nasty. Let me now draw some concluding remarks and move to the final section of the presentation. A posthumanist perspective allows for a fruitful dialogue between past and present over and above the building of environmental awareness. The illustrator Natalia Capazzulia has given us a lot to play with. There are many animals, plants, and pieces of material culture in the illustrations. 
all of them can be seen as actors that challenge human action. For all its layers of um, modern reception, there is room for further questioning and sanitation of the classical past. I say sanitation because with reference to Artemis, I suggested that we could perhaps obliterate the hunting. Devoid of their typical attributes, these Greek figures will no longer be identifiable. We will not have Artemis, the huntress, alongside the deer, as we also recognize here in ancient sculptures and vast paintings. And we see here, for an example, in the slide, a limestone statuette from uh, Cyprus uh, showing Artemis uh, with a fawn, and uh, it is from the late 4th to the 2nd century BC in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. So Artemis will become a child of the modern era and her new understanding will be historically contingent in reflecting to some degree at least modern agendas about how humans should behave. The classical past is suited for a critical, for a critical, excuse me, historically contingent reappraisal, perhaps also because what happened back in ancient times was really striking. We have bull leaping in Minoan Crete. We have Leonidas climbing up a mountain in full armor, which is quite impractical, but he wants to feel in control. And we have Heracles wearing a lion, and the lion is alive. The gods Artemis and Hermes behave irresponsibly, hunting and killing animals. The image that might be less striking is Solon's father in the garden. And perhaps this is not random. The image of Solon's father comes uh, from a book about a statesman, a historical, not a mythical figure, who made a difference by being committed to social justice. Committed to social justice. And social justice is one of the driving forces in post-humanism. A critical post-humanist reading of the books here entails comparisons, contrasts, taking apart and rebuilding. As a result, our mythical nature becomes a creative exercise in itself, a project of continuous definition and redefinition, but in any case, a project of great relevance to our modern world and its unique global challenges. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.